And we are in a series called Necessary Endings, and we really believe that great is the art of beginning, to begin anything. I want you to think about when you got married, you started a new chapter in your life. When we came home with Jude, he was born 507, June 1st, 1989. He took his first breath. We would come home. Life would never be the same. So great is the art of beginning, but I have to tell you, even greater is the art of ending. And we oftentimes know how to begin a season of life or a project or an adventure, but we struggle ending. And endings, the reason why this is very important, because if we don't end some things today, it will hinder us from living the life that God has for us in the future. And so today I want us to go to John chapter 15, and we're going to talk about you're pruned if you do, and you're pruned if you don't. And, and so that God wants us to bear more fruit. And I want you to maybe write these words down, uh, begin to chat them if you are online put them in the chat right there I want you to begin to think of sow and reap and we talked about that last week but then I want you to begin to think about lifting up and pruning and abiding I'm gonna say those four words again lifting up pruning and abiding good lord I don't know how to count that's three words <laughs> I went to school. Becky's better at math, though. Okay, so we're thinking about lifting up, pruning, and abiding. And this is what I, I want to ask us this question. What thoughts and emotions do we need to lift out of the dirt? Is there any feelings or thinking in your brain or my brain that we just need to lift it up out of the dirt? Can I tell you one thing that when one season ends and another one begins, there's going to be thoughts and feelings that stay in another season. For example, when Becky and I moved into the empty nest season, we were trying to act like we had a house filled with kids and we had to literally lift some of our thinking up. Are you with me? Today, I promise you, you're going to lift up your thoughts, your thinking, your feeling out of the dirt, and God is going to renew our mind and our thinking. Another one is what area of your life needs to be pruned? What area that we need to say no to? And by, for the record, we're going to see God doesn't prune something that's not successful or fruitful. He prunes that which is fruitful. And anytime, don't think it's strange or shocking. If you have an area in your life that's very fruitful, that all of a sudden it gets pruned. And God is not pruning us to discipline us or hurt us or deprive us. He is pruning us that we would bear more fruit. And, and that's what he does. And so I want us to begin to think of this. I want you to also ask yourself, what area of your lives are producing what I call a false sense of identity? What area of your life and my life, it produces an identity that's not true. We need to prune that area. We need to lift that area up and we need to begin to abide in God. Now, at City Church, we always bring a Bible. How many of you have your Bibles? Come on, wave it in the air. How many of you are using a smartphone today? All right, so go. are you in John? Okay, that's what this is for. You know, oh, and I just lost my place. Is that not maddening? My gosh. And that happens with the Bible ribbon. How many of you ever used the Bible ribbon? <laughs> One guy goes, I think so. Okay. <laughs> so here we go. Bible ribbon back in place. Okay. John 15. Let me just give you a little bit of context where we're at. John, to me, in my opinion, is the greatest gospel. It's not one of what is called the synoptic gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, because they are very much the same. John just goes off the track on his gospel, and it truly is incredible. Augustine, one of the early church fathers, said of the gospel of John, it is shallow enough where a toddler could wade in, but it's deep enough for an elephant to swim in. When I found Christ or Christ found me, the first thing they told us, and maybe we need to go back to this, start reading the gospel of John. And so in the last 42 years, it has been one of my favorite books is the gospel 
Gospel of John. And it is amazing. But before we get to 15, let me tell you what was happening in 13. Jesus is in an upper room. His ministry is now going to come to an end. He's preparing to go to the cross. And he's experiencing the Last Supper with his disciples. And one of his disciples betrays him, and it's Judas Iscariot. And at the end of 13, it's one of my favorite phrases in the entire scriptures. He says this, let us arise and be on our way. Pope John Paul II wrote an entire book with that title to young believers around the world, let us rise. If I would say today, the major reason why we need to have necessary endings in some parts of our mind, our hearts, and our life, because if we don't, we will not be able to arise and go on our way. I am not going to be dragged down by what's happening in this nation and world. I am going to arise because Jesus Christ not only died on the cross, he was buried. He is risen. And if he is risen, we can rise. Can you say amen? Now, one of my favorite things of chapter 13, I really want you to get this, and I try to live my life this way. This is the first verse in chapter 13. Don't worry, I've got a Bible ribbon. I know we're going to 15, but you need some context. You've just gotten into the cul-de-sac. I am the true vine, and you don't even know what this development's about probably, so I'm just trying to acclimate you to this neighborhood. And one of my favorite things he says in John 13, verse 1, he says this, I love them to the end. Can I tell you, folks, that would be good for any parent, any spouse, any pastor. For example, when I was a youth pastor, I thought I would do it for the rest of my life. But when that season ended and I was good, I think I was probably the best youth pastor in all the United States of America. You know, in full humility, I think maybe even the world. And I was so good at it, I thought it was going to last forever. But when the brakes came to a screeching halt on that season of my life, I, I was tormented. But you know what helped me move on? The Spirit of God would bring John 13, 1. Did you love him to the end? Did you give them your best? You know what another Greek meaning of that word is? I love them to the max. Can I say right now, no matter what season you're in, I'm in, we're going to do it to the end and to the max. Can you say amen? Now get this, 14, they arise. Remember 13, arise, let us be on our way. Judas Iscariot, thug, uh, when I, I'm telling you, someone needed to slap Judas. How many of you know a Christian that needs to be slapped? No, come on, that is so weird. <laughs> a lady raised her hand, my husband, no. <laughs> that is so funny, that makes me laugh. Bam. Okay, so get this, they are now going to the garden, Judas isn't there, and Jesus begins to tell them, please get this, please get this, it's necessary endings. You're not going to get 15 if you don't get 14. He said, I must go away. I'm going to have to end this type of ministry. Because if I keep ministering to you in this way, then the future cannot come. Can I say, do not be perplexed on what's happened in the last two years. God is not a God of death, confusion, or destruction. But God can use what's happening in the world to cause an ending in one area of our life to project us into the future of another ministry or area of our life. Are you with me on that? And so then here we are. We are in John 15, and we're going to begin to read now. So look for words like vine, branch, take away, prune, abide. If you could only do one word because it's like my brain could only do one. Look at abide and circle it every time you hear it. Here it goes. I'm reading from the B-I-B-L-E. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser, meaning he is the manager of Napa Valley. <laughs> Every branch in me, that preposition's important. It's throughout these eight verses. In me, not with me, in me. And if he didn't go away, they couldn't be in him and he couldn't be in them. It's important. In me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, underlying take away, chatted. 
Say it. Someone wanted to say it. Say it. Take away. And it says this, in every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Why does he prune? To be mean? To take something from you? You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in, here goes this word, me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now look, when someone's writing and they're using the same word over and over and over It behooves us to know what that word means, and we'll get to that in a moment. I am the vine. You are the branches. Underline that. Guess what? He didn't say you're the branch. Church isn't about you being this branch. Man, my branch is really nice looking. No, we are branches together, and that's why church online, church in person, is now more important in this era of living in the world than it was before because we are mighty when the branches are with one another. Thank you for that overwhelming response. Okay. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Not good. If you abide in me, here it goes again, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified. Why? That you bear much fruit. Why? So you will be my disciples. So he is saying fruit, more fruit, much fruit, fruit that remains. So the first thing I want to begin to draw our attention to as we begin to hang out together is the word true vine. Why did he start off with that word? He said, I am the true vine. He backs up and he says, my father is the manager of this vineyard, meaning he's the one who planted the vine. He's the one who's in charge of the vineyard. But Jesus says, I am the true vine. I want you to begin to write this down or at least contemplate with me the word true. The word true actually it means authentic, genuine, and sincere. And so why, would he, why didn't he just say, I am the vine? Why would he say, I am the true vine? I would say right now, if you are a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, children's ministry, youth ministry, young adult ministry, what is needed right now, I believe if you're just married, how can we tell the difference between something that is genuine and something that is not genuine? We need truth in the United States of America. And it is our prayer. The reason why we say bring a Bible, bring a friend is because Because we are not here sharing our opinions with you on Jesus Christ, but we are sharing the truth about Jesus Christ. Are you with me? And so why would Jesus say, I am the true vine? Well, you must understand something. From the very, very beginning of Scripture, God began to liken his people to a vine. In fact, one of the first times that this analogy or metaphor is mentioned is in the book of Genesis. Jacob had 12 sons, and one of his younger sons, Joseph, had a dream. And his dream was that his father and his brothers and his mom bowed down to him, and that their sheaves, it's our agricultural term, would bow to his. And it was out of context. Come next week. You do not want to miss next week. I mean, unnecessary endings that were unexpected. There are things that happen in life that we did not plan. It comes around the corner and that season of our life ends. How do we handle that? That happened to Joseph. So get this. The prophecy of Joseph was that he would be a vine that would go over the wall. Can I say right now as a church, I believe our greatest evangelistic energy, mode of operation 
is that we are branches that dwell and are connected to the true vine. Are you with me? Now, in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, it's going to use terms like true vine and false vine. Write this down. Isaiah chapter 5, it starts off, and you could read even in the heading, it says, my true vine that I planted on my hill, I am going to sing a song to my beloved. And he begins to talk about a true vine. And then he says, I planted you on a fertile hill. You are my true vine. And he says, you're going to bring forth grapes. But then the prophet changes and he said, you didn't bring forth grapes. You actually brought forth sour grapes, unedible grapes. Get this. One commentary says this, toxic grape. Hey, the church is never meant to get into the toxicity of the world of life and of nature. We are connected to the true life source. Are you with me? Now, listen to this. During the Maccabean period, which is, if you said, I don't even know what that is. This is a Bible. It has the old part and the new part. It has the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's 400 years between old and new. That is called the Maccabean period. And during that time, the Maccabeans or Maccabees got, and they minted coins. And you'll never guess what's on their coin. They've uh, discovered this. It, it is a vine. And, and it was the true vine. And during that intertestament period of 400 years, they were reminding Israel that God had promised that he would plant a true vine, and that true vine, Israel, would go over the walls of religion and faith and begin to have the power to change the world. In fact, it was such a strong, clear symbol for Israel that when Herod began to rebuild the temple, guess what? In the, in the rebuilt temple, he had engraved a vine with grapes and it was overlaid in gold reminding them that Israel would be a true temple. I mean the true vine. They would be a life source. Guess what Jesus comes? He comes and he says this, I am the true vine. He said Israel, you're, you never had the capability of being a true vine. You tried your best but you became toxic, unbelieving. Your grapes were unedible. He, they couldn't make wine out of you. It was a sour, undrinkable drink. He said, but now I am going to take your place. I am going to be a genuine and authentic vine that produces wine. And so much so at the first sign in the book of John, what is the first miracle? He changes water into wine. And what is he saying? He is saying, hey, the true vine is here. And not only only are you going to have a true vine, I'm going to make true wine, and I have saved the best wine for last. We are the church. We're not just connected to one another. We're not just connected to a fellowship. We are connected to the vine, Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? And so please hear me. Without being connected to the life sword, Jesus Christ, Michelle, what happens to our lives is we degenerate, we regress. We may be doing well in one season, then all of a sudden we're not doing well, that no one has the power, the source to be an ungenerated, powerful, life-giving presence, only Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Now listen to this. In Psalms 80, it begins to talk about that false vine. Get this, and it says the branches are empty because the vine is false, it bears no fruit, and I don't want to be a part of a community. Let me just stop right here. I'm going to change the way I just said that. We are a part of a vibrant, living church that we're going to have fruit that changes the entire Southern California. Can you say amen? And, and so we believe that. Everyone say true vine. Say it again. 
And so it's true, it's authentic, it's genuine. Now, I want to look at these two words. He says this, if you go back in your Bible, I'm going to try to do it from memory. He said, I am the true vine. Then he says, my father is the vine dresser or the manager of the vineyard. Now get this, every branch in me, so that branch is in him that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Please underline that, takes away. In every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Thus, that's where we got the title, I'm pruned if I do, I'm pruned if I don't. So what does it mean, take away? Now, let me tell you what I used to think that meant for a long, long time. And commentaries even say this. They have one recent commentary and one that's about 100 years old that say the same thing, which says, take away, that if your life and my life are not bearing fruit for God, he removes you from Jesus Christ and from eternity. Can I say that is so bogus. That's absolutely not true. If you look up that word, and you can, you could go on your smartphone, get a strong concordance, and double click on take away. It actually means to lift up. It means to lift up. You see, branches are by nature or clingy things. They cling to one another. And that's why when you see branches, they, they grow all around each other. And in a vineyard, if you've ever been to Napa or you've been to Santa Barbara or the Central Coast, and you see a vineyard, you'll see a trellis. And the trellis kind of looks like a cross. And if the vine falls off the cross and it begins to wallow in the dirt, it will never produce fruit. So the Greek word takeaway actually doesn't mean cut off or takeaway. That branch is in God. And if you're in God, the true vine, he's not going to cut you off because you had a bad day. For years, I thought every area in my life, I do inventory all the time that was not bearing fruit. It's over. You're cut off. You have no life support. He's not saying that at all. Guess what it means? It means to lift up. It means that you're going to raise that branch out of the dirt. You're going to wash it and clean it, and you're going to put it back on the trellis. And you know what the trellis is? It's the church of Jesus Christ. The trellis has no power to give life to a branch. It only provides structure and support for the branch to cling around something that is life-giving and not something that drains life life from us how many of you do you know someone who drains you oh don't look at me that you're all that then some in a can of holy pringle that friend that drains you and you see him in your starbucks you will leave that starbucks and go to pete's three miles away can i say and let me can i say this what are you wrapping your brain around what are you wrapping your feelings around? If it's in the past, you're in the dirt. Can I tell you, please hear me. One of the names of one of the great enemies of Israel in the Old Testament was the Philistines. And their name in Hebrew means to wallow in the dirt or eat dirt. Can I tell you, there's only one creature that should be wallowing in the dirt, and that is Satan, the serpent. God never chose you and I to wallow in the dirt and eat the food of a devil. We were called to wallow in Jesus Christ and who he is. Come on. And so... For me, the reason why I love coming to church, and let me just say, if you're online, we're grateful. And I get that because people have issues in their body, and we are grateful we get to do church here and online. However, people, I have to tell you, branches are a type of church. They are made to be interconnected, intertwined, and we do not live good lives if you're a branch all by yourself, stuck in the dirt, eating the devil's food. I don't want to eat that anymore. I want to move on from the past, and I need God, believers, men, women to come and pick me up. Up, off the dirt and put me back into the church. So if you have a friend, a spouse, a child, I, I don't feel like going to church. My boys used to say that. 
I'm tired. I don't want to go to church. I said, oh, baby, you don't have to go to church. But don't play your Xbox for a year. <laughs> Give me that iPad right now. <laughs> you know? Or when the boys would come, I don't, I don't want to worship. Oh, well, why were you raising your hand when you won the wrestling match? If you can't raise one finger for Jesus, let's not wrestle this week. Everyone say, lift me up. up. Say it again. That's what that means. Take him away. He comes and he watches. And we know that he said, you're already clean. What was he talking about? The one who wasn't clean, the one who wasn't attached, wasn't in this meeting. Because you see, they were having the last supper. Judas, Satan had filled his heart, left, exited stage left. And he went to betray Jesus for money and did it with a kiss. But he's not there. And that's why Jesus said, hey, the one who's been taken away, he's already cut off. He said, can I ask you a question? Why are you and I getting our advice from branches who are not connected to the true source? Why do I not get my advice from people who are connected to the same source I'm connected to? And I don't need a fellow branch who's eating dirt to give me another appetizer. Here we go. Nachos with dirt again. We got dirt nachos, dirt manicotti, dirt lasagna, dirt tacos, dirt quesadillas. Come on. How many times are we going to talk about your past? How many times are you going to pull that scab off? How many times are you going to get off the trellis and get into the dirt? Jesus said, I have power to lift you up. Come on. So everyone say, lift up. Now listen, if if you want to know, remember, they had 10 lepers. And what did they do? They lifted, same Greek word, their voice, Lord, have mercy on us. When you and I begin to realize that Jesus Christ is not going to prune us to hurt us, destroy us, or hinder us, and he's not here looking at every fault that we have, but our God is a lifting God. Can I tell you, maybe you made a big mistake. Maybe in the last two years you made a choice that has almost ruined your life. Can I tell you, there was a woman caught in the very act. And what did religion want to do? What did false Israel want to do? What did the false vine want to do? Anytime something that's not true they're going to pull everyone else down to the dirt because that's where their conscience is Ooh, that's good i'm gonna sit down on that hey are you with me but what did she's there he said woman where are your accusers but what did he do he got down and wrote in the dirt Can I tell you, I don't know what your dirt is, but you have a God that manages the vineyard of your life in this world, and it's not mandated, but he will, if you allow him, pick you up, wash you off, and put you back on the cross where you belong. Are you with me? Now, the next one is pruned. Look at your name and say, ouch. Look at your other name and say, that's not good. How many of you want fruit? How many of you want more fruit? How many of you want much fruit? How many want your life to count even after you're in heaven? Come on. Okay, you need to be pruned. Oh, I want fruit. I don't want to be pruned though. Okay, let's do it this way. Who's single in here? Bro, you could get married this year. Ladies, look at this. Come on. Okay, now watch it this. He cannot get engaged if he's still clinging to the dirt that I just want to date a million people. And then when I'm 80, I'll get married. You'll be too old to get married. No, I'm not joking. If you're 80, I'm going to be 70 in eight years. That's very young. My gosh, come on. He can't get married if he doesn't end the season of singleness. Now watch this. One of the greatest prunings you'll ever do and receive and experience. When you say yes to something great, trust me when I tell you, you're going to have to say no to something. When you become fruitful or successful, your no becomes just as important as your yes. Oh, you're still not tracking. Man, come on up. I have, I am already three minutes out of time. My gosh, here. Watch this, watch this. A man stands before a woman. Is it right over left? They asked me this. Over a hundred official wedding ceremonies I've officiated. 
It's like, right over left. Bend your knees. Don't pass out. <laughs> Kiss the bride. What does he say? I promise you, I will choose you and no other as long as we both shall live. My body will be your body in good times and bad, prosperity and poverty, sickness and health. You're mine and I'm yours. One of my friends, very successful, very sharp looking, was two sports at university. It took him a long time to get married. And I remember one time he saying, bro, I mean, you're good looking, but you're not that great looking. What's the deal? <laughs> he said, one of my biggest concerns, the reason why, have you ever met someone who's, they can't commit? They have a problem with commitment. That's a trust issue. He says, what if I commit and I marry someone, but a more beautiful gal comes along? Called him by his name and said, so-and-so, go to the bank on that one. That will happen. And there are at least 1,000 men in the state of California that are better looking than you. Know that. You're not that great looking. <laughs> Why is it on a scale of 1 to 10, a woman will marry a man who is a negative 5? But a man only, he could be so ugly. He is the devil eating dirt and he, he wants a tent. It's like, go look in the mirror. That's not going to happen. Unless <laughs> she's impaired with her sight. Not going to happen. So get this. I said, that's always going to be. If that, you know what that is? That's eating dirt. Because my commitment isn't based on that person as much as it's based on God. Are you with me? And that person, of course, your spouse. So get this, everyone say pruned. So I said, you're gonna have to be pruned. If you're gonna be married, you're gonna have to say no to a lot of things. If you wanna be married, son, you're gonna have to say no to the remote. <laughs> Long golf weekends, bye-bye. No, not really, that's not true. Ladies, you should let your man do a few things. My goodness. You're not his mother. And if you try to be his mother, he can't make out with you. Oh, oh shit. Let's, let's stop. Okay, I want you to write this down. This is where we'll end. Why did he say branches? Get this. Branch? No. I know it. You need to know it too. Bible ribbon, go to 15. It says this, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That doesn't mean cut off, remove. It means lift up and wash. Every branch that bears fruit, what area of your life is fruitful? That's the area that's going to be pruned. And what does that mean? You're going to have to say no to it. Why? That you would bear more fruit fruit you would bear more fruit I want you to write these three things down number one he's going to cut off healthy buds that aren't the best there are things in your life in my life that are healthy but they're not the best for me so I'm going to have to remove that let me explain what I mean by that when you've been an associate pastor in a church, which is that divine trellis, it's not the life source. Church itself is not the life source. Only the true vine is the life source. The church is just a structure that lifts us up and wraps us around. Hear me when I tell you. The church is here like a trellis until you and I aren't weak branches. We become strong branches as we wrap around and become interconnected with Jesus Christ. And I say and tell you, he is my life source. Healthy buds in our life need to be cut off that aren't producing good. Let me explain to you what I mean. When you're a youth pastor, a worship pastor, a children's pastor, a young adult pastor in a church, you have your ministry, you have your focus. When you become a lead pastor, your number one job, hear me, is to feed the people. And there's so many demands, sometimes in a smaller church than even a large megachurch. And you will start saying yes to so many things 
you can't say yes to the one thing that is necessary. And I remember when we started here, my pastor, Wendell Smith, before he passed away, he said, Jude, now that you are a lead pastor, you can't say yes to everyone in every circumstance. You need to begin to ask yourself the question, what is the things that only I can do? And I thought one of the main things that a lead pastor does is he feeds people, she feeds people. They, they communicate the Bible. Now in our church, we are fortunate, you are very blessed because I could raise a leader up out of dirt. And we have many communicators and that is awesome. But Jesus said, remember Martha and Mary? Mary has chosen the one thing. God prunes good things in our lives that are not producing the optimum fruit of our lives. What do you need to say no to right now? Let's say, for example, you're struggling in your marriage. Do you really need to go to that third Bible study this week? Do you really need to go and talk to that friend on the phone? Or do you simply need to go, you and your spouse, on a date? Say no to something. We cannot say yes to everything. Are you with me? The next one, sick branches that are going to get, they're not going to get well. Can I say right now, there are people in my life that I have to watch. Like one of them called me at seven in the morning this week. Well, I was seeking Jesus in this smartphone, which is really a dumb phone. And I thought, Juju and Sierra out of town. I better see. It may be him. Something may be up with my grandkid. Turned it over. It's this one person. I thought, not right now, I'm with Jesus. I'm the branch, he's a true vine. Then at three in the afternoon, I'm in a meeting. Calls again, then texts, you are so hard to get a hold of. And I said, bro, I'm in a meeting. And I said, and for the record, you are still in the same position you've been in for a bit. I'm gonna have to put some boundaries on this, this relation. Are you with me on that? Okay, next one, next one. We're moving on, we're moving on. Dead branches that are taking up space. I would never have been a youth pastor, I mean, a lead pastor if I didn't let go being a youth pastor. And I wasn't gonna let it go. Where it almost became forced and it wasn't because of morality, misappropriation of funds. The pastor's son wanted to be a youth pastor. If he wanted to be a women's pastor, worship pastor, children's pastor, I'd probably still be a youth pastor. And that would end. And that really bothered me because I thought, God, how can you cut out the one thing that is bearing fruit in my life? And I couldn't understand it until I realized because he wanted more fruit. And there were a group of people in Southern California that must have been praying for some to come and be relocated in another vineyard. And because Jesus and the Father are in charge of this vineyard, me wallowing in the dirt wasn't sin or the muck or the mire. I began to get into the dirt off the trellis thinking, oh my goodness, look at the fruit. Can I tell you, I am glad that that happened because now we have more fruit, much fruit, remaining fruit. I want fruit in my life. And so he had to prune that. What area of your life needs to be cut off? Do you know a person that's dragging you down? Have you ever heard the phrase, I can't wrap my brain around it? You know what? If you can't get your brain around it, it's probably the devil. Stop it. Pick that thought up. Put it back on the cross. Wash it off and let's move on. Can you say amen? Okay, everyone say lift up, prune, and then write this down, made to cling. Say it again. Now, let me just say this. The branch is not the vine. And remember, it says, I am the vine. Say that after me. I am the vine. You're good. Say it one more time. I am the vine. Say, we are the branches. We are branches. Say that again. We are branches. Mm. People, I've heard people say this recently. I love Jesus. I don't like the church then you're probably not connected to Jesus. 
because it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. They have a way about them. They get really clingy. How many of you ever had a clingy friend? Wait. It's really a representation of what the church should be. I am grateful for the church of Jesus Christ. This week, I heard some disturbing news about two men that are friends of mine and I love, and they use that word I hate. There's a word in the English language, I hate it. I hate when I hear it, I can't stand it. It's definitely a word from the dirt. It's what Satan eats, and that word is cancer. And I heard a fellow pastor friend of mine, and they put that word. He texts me on Friday. I was at the health club, and right there I stopped working out. It wasn't long, but because I realized I'm not a branch connected to the vine. We are branches and we cling to one another and our synergy and our connectedness where two or three are gathered. There are two or three branches in me, in my name. I'm going to lift them up and I'll prune them and I'll wash them and I'll bring the best out of them. But I need the branches. Then I heard a friend of mine, friend for at least 20 something years, may have a skin cancer. Can I say life is not forever? We have but one life and I want to make a difference with my life. And it is erroneous to think that we could be connected to Jesus Christ and not have a passion or a conviction or even a longing or a missing of being with the other branches that are connected to Jesus Christ because that's the nature of the church. We can never be a people that bring people down. I pray whether it's Steve, Michael, myself, Becky, anyone else who speaks in this church that our sermons do not pull you down to the dirt but we lift you up to the highest seven. Come on. And this is where we, and honestly, I'm in, we're going to do this song. I want you to begin to think about this. That's the church of Jesus Christ. If you go, our friend Gina's here. Will you wave at her? Isn't that funny? I was going to do a parade wave. That's kind of a fast parade wave, wasn't it? That parade wave's on Red Bull, my goodness. Can you wave at Gina? If when Gina, you know how sometimes I had a phone forever, didn't know you could do this. You could actually put a person's face connected to their number. Did you not know that? (laughs) Why is I'm the one always teaching you these things? I didn't know either. Whoa, that went really far. When Gina calls, or if I have to call Gina, It's not just a picture of her. Okay, you know what this is? Charades? These are the branches, silly. (laughs) The picture is of Gina and Becky, and it's nine years old. And it's at the beach in Carpinteria. And nine years ago, Every treatment that Becky would go through, Gina was there. In the very last one, the last one, we would go and celebrate at the beach in Carpinteria. So it's a picture of Gina and Becky. And it's just two branches that have clung to one another and their life source is in a vine, the vine, not a false vine, not a vine that degenerates, not a vine that is toxic, not a vine that destroys, but a vine that even lifts one another up. And he prunes, and I want you to hear this. He goes on, he says this, every branch that is not in me, that was Judas Iscariot. If you're not in Jesus today, in a few minutes, 
we could correct that right now. You will be engrafted in and you will begin to receive the nutrients, the nature and the properties of that new, true, only authentic vine. And that's what he does. Amen. But I want you to know right now, it's the church of Jesus Christ where we're really lifted up and we're never the same. Now get this. He said, every branch that's not in me is cut away and tossed aside and burned. That's not you and me. I'm saved. You didn't save me. I didn't save myself. And because I didn't save myself, I can't unsave myself. I will not unsave myself. You say, well, what happens when you're dwelling in the dirt and you do something wrong? Oh, I know exactly what I do. I find another Christian and say, come on, Branch, come over here. I need some help. And then I always tell Jesus, hey, you are a better Savior than I am a sinner. I'm in the dirt right now. Lift me up, wash me clean, and let's move on. I want to bear fruit with God. Amen? Okay, ending. Oh, Steve, I'm ending. I did use that format in, okay. But Steve wrote a new format for me to do my preaching that I could end on time and be more clear, so I hope it worked. We'll see. You don't have to tell me that. No, go back to the old. No, I'm liking this format. Okay, get this. Every branch that's not in me is taken away and burned. But listen to this. But the branches that are in me, please get this. You will ask. I like old King James. I think it says this. You will ask whatever you wish. New King James. You will ask whatever you desire. And whatever you ask, can I tell you the vine life changes the way you live. The vine life changes the way we pray. The vine life changes everything about us. That we're not praying, begging God to forgive us. We're not praying, begging God to get us out of the dirt. Jesus Christ already went to a cross. He was buried in the dirt. And on the third day, he rose again. That no branch in him would ever live in the dirt, eat the devil's food, but be raised to everlasting life. Come on. And that we could ask whatever we desire. For goodness sakes, Ian bounds. And his volume on prayer has chapters on prayer and desire. If our battle is always fighting against some type of desire, we need to be lifted up and pruned that we can come to God in a powerful form of prayer and join our desires with God and it will be done. And that's where much fruit comes from.